We've only seen this backwardation. This is uh, tight as she can be, over a buck. We've only seen it twice. And on each of those occasions, it made $100 oil. It said, your CEO calls $100 oil. When will we hit $100 oil? And is the market tight enough to achieve that? Well, thank you for having me on. Um, I think, as you say, the, the, you know, the, the current structure in the market is absolutely telling you that the market is hungry for oil. Uh, we've moved from a situation where the recovery really was China-led, manufacturing-led, and goods-led. And now we're moving into something that is more U.S.-led, Europe-led, uh, is more services-led, and more experiences-led. So as everyone is out there hitting the road, uh, taking to the skies again, you are seeing a very strong demand recovery. Uh, and I think that some of the, the real issues that were in the market, uh, we were talking about the sort of the three big eyes, India, Iran, inflation. You know, India's really started to recover there. You're starting to see demand and mobility indicators start to pick up. Iran mm -hmm. at least seems to be absorbed by the market. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we've had all the talk about inflation, but even that seems to have been absorbed by the market. So now going to where do we think we could hit $100 oil? We're, for us, this has really been a question about structural underinvestment that you've been seeing now since 2014. So this is now going on to the better part of a decade. Um, and to me, this is something where the market is slowly realizing that even with all the spare capacity that OPEC currently has off the market, that eventually you're, you're going to be in a situation where demand has not only recovered, but is stronger than where it was. And you don't have that capacity anymore that you really need, other than maybe as a little bit of a buffer. Um, and in some sense, it's going to be like Hemingway said about bankruptcy, which is it's going to happen gradually and then suddenly. And all of a sudden, I think the market is going to wake up and realize, you know, we have lost significant production from a lot of the smaller producers that people don't talk about, Angola, Mexico, Colombia, Vietnam, just to name a few, uh, and that that production really needs a much higher price, not just in the front, but in the back to really to incentivize new production to start to come on. If I can push you a little bit on that. Can we get a little bit more specific? When do you think that that kind of environment is going to be put in place? It's going to happen gradually, but is it going to be next year? Is it two years from now? Is it five years from now? When do we get exactly that $100 barrel in oil? Well, I think, look, I think the demand recovery that we're looking at, I think the amount of stimulus that's gone into the system, and I think the liquidity that's there, I think it is something that you could see potentially next year. Um, assuming, you know, we don't see real movement on rates or anything else to really slow this economy down, it is something where you will, you will quite quickly, I think, run out of spare capacity as that demand recovers back to pre-pandemic levels. So, you know, given the conditions that we are seeing, uh, given how quickly, frankly, we've come from $35 back up to $70, uh, to $75, you know, this is something that you could see in the next maybe 12 to 18 months. Um, but again, you know, it has to be really conditions have to be right for that. OK, let's talk about what OPEC Plus would do in the face of this. We're going into a meeting next week. We know His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman likes to keep traders uh, jumping uh, on the floor. Ouching, I think he said, uh, just over a year ago. So do you expect, with this narrative that you just said, which is services, the eyes are being absorbed, we're moving off the manufacturing into services and travel, do you think that OPEC will return barrels more quickly than we have currently penciled in? after this structure that they've announced for July? I think they're, they're happy with the pace of the recovery right now. Um, and, you know, they're happy with where prices are. Uh, and again, we're not talking about $100 coming in the next couple of months. You know, there is still, again, that spare capacity out there. We are seeing more barrels come into the market. But certainly this backwardation, the structure is telling you that the market wants more barrels from OPEC. So I think this gradual pace that they're bringing on, I think, suits them very well. Um, what they may do instead is to is to look at their uh, official selling prices, right? So really to raise uh, the prices for their customers and test really the demand waters and see, you know, is there demand at these higher price levels, in which case that's telling you that the market is saying you can increase production a bit more quickly. Now, some of this will also depend on what's happening with Iran. Um, you know, if there is more progress towards a deal uh, and barrels may be coming on sooner than, than OPEC is thinking today, then there may have to be some adjustment to, to account for that. But again, given the strength of the market, you could suggest perhaps that at least a gradual return of Iran might be able to be absorbed by the market to some degree. So I think OPEC is, is in a sweet spot right now, really, um, with regards to bringing on production back more slowly. Um, and you're not seeing a recovery out of the U.S. in particular, which may be the other concern, you know, as prices have moved mm -hmm. up uh, to the levels that they have. To what extent should the market be pricing in uh, return of Iranian crude into the market? 
I mean, I think most market observers and participants are penciling in some form of return of Iranian barrels, uh, likely more in the Q3, late Q3, Q4 timeframe. Um, you know, when there certainly seems to have been quite a bit of progress on on, on the talks, uh, but you know, there may be plenty of room still still between the parties uh, that, that we're not aware of. But right now, I think most participants would say, look, you know, we're expecting some of these barrels to really start to come back into the market. Um, and frankly, even earlier in the year, we've seen some barrels already moving east uh, out of floating storage and things like that. And the market has, again, has been able to absorb that, right? So uh, this is really something where you can dial this up, dial this down, depending on, on, you know, where you think the market conditions are. And given where we think, you know, travel is getting to, where, where not just gasoline demand, but also now jet recovering in a way that I don't think many people had, uh, you're saying, you know, this is not something that I think is worrying the market as much as it was a few months ago. Yeah, could you imagine what happens if they actually get around to getting rapid testing uh, as you go to get on a plane? That would be, that, right. that's actually when you, when you radically shift. For me, mm. that's when you radically shift and you talk about much bigger uh, product demand. So let's pivot to, to, to the global commodity super cycle. I know that you as a house call a slightly longer uh, cycle than we are. But where are we on copper? We see the Chinese stepping into the market, trying to take the heat out of, of this ratchet higher in hard commodities and soft commodities. You would say that we need a better incentive price for copper. What do you make of the Chinese stepping in? And what is the incentive price that brings on more production? Well, I mean, I think, you know, if you're looking at this from the Chinese perspective, certainly it's been successful in, in terms of jawboning it down, right? We were at $10,700, and now we were looking like we were going to threaten $8,700, you know, a, a couple of days ago. So certainly that price has come off a lot. And we saw it in China. You could see the physical market weakening, you know, as buyers were holding off purchases. Um, you know, as working capital requirements went up, you had to get authorization for higher spending, et cetera, you know, from places like the state grid, even the army, you know, and, and the metal they were using, you were having to see them go back and get and get more um, more budget, basically, right? Uh, and you could see the ARB into China really closing, you know, so the metal wasn't moving. The, the structure there was in contango or is in contango, as opposed to the backwardation that we're seeing in oil markets. So again, it was telling you that there was a bit of physical weakness there. Uh, but this, to me, really, this is a short-term story, right? This is just allowing a little bit of a pause, a little bit of a breather. You know, you've done a lot since the start of the year, let alone since uh, the bottom last year. So this is really time for the market to adjust, take a breath, um, before you really come back into the second part of this year. You know, part of it, again, you can see what's happening in the U.S. as, you know, tight housing inventory has led to a slowdown in sales, tight lumber markets mm. have led to an increase in prices, et cetera. So that, that led to some loss of demand there as well. Uh, chip shortages impacting auto production globally. So all these things have been, have, have been factors in weighing markets down in the front right now. And then, of course, what we've had, you know, with the dollar move uh, and the Fed the last week or so has absolutely exacerbated that. Um, but if you look beyond the next couple of months, you absolutely still need that metal, right? Um, the state grid is still going to have to come back and, and buy more metal towards the end of the year, but they're doing it at a position where now it's, you know, $1,000, $1,500 less than where it was earlier. And nothing has changed in terms of the demand coming from the energy transition. Um, you still absolutely need that metal. And for that, you need, as we've discussed before, a much higher incentive price in order to incentivize those mines and that supply to come on in time. Does that mean that your head of uh, copper trading's call of, of $15,000 uh, in the metal, does that still stand given perhaps this only short-term uh, pressure uh, on copper prices? I mean, absolutely for us, right? We're looking at that saying, this is really where you need to get to in order to bring on these supplies. Otherwise, you are looking at a sizable deficit. Uh, and as I've said before, really, copper isn't something that you substitute away from. It's what you substitute to uh, when, you're, when you're bringing in renewable power, electric, uh, you know, electric vehicles, electrification of the grid, all of that. Um, and so it's not something that you, that you can really replace, and you have to bring on new supply. The problem is the time it takes to bring on new supply, which is something like seven to 10 years. And we've seen it, right? With prices even above 10,000, 10,500, you have not seen the new projects that you would have expected start to be, you know, FID to get, to get approved um, and to move forward. So, you know, this is telling you again, the market's telling you, look, we need to be much, much higher from here uh, in order to mm -hmm. give, you know, corporate boards and shareholders and everyone else the, the sort of confidence that this demand will be there and these prices will be there if they start to bring on mines that won't be online for quite some time.